All right, so we're making progress on this thing. Uh, we got the crank in it. First, if you're making a swap from a 318 to a 360 in a car, keep in mind that the 318 and 360 oil pans are different. The pan itself is the same, but the 360 uses a smaller diameter main cap. So you've got to use a specific pan for it. So this is one we picked up cheap online. It was like $50. Uh, okay. Crank is in. Uh, but let's talk about a couple of things that you guys brought up. The first is balancing. Um, here's the story with balancing, right? Have you ever wondered why engines have a red line? So you'll see the red line starts at like 5,500 RPM, but you know it'll spin to like 6,500. The, one of the major factors in a red line is the factory production tolerances, the, the factory production balance tolerances in an engine. So when, when a manufacturer builds an engine, they don't take each piston and rod assembly and match it carefully to the crankshaft. That's race engine stuff. That's high RPM race engine stuff. These things are batch balanced. All of the rods weigh within a, a couple of grams of each other. All of the pistons within a couple of grams of each other. All of the balance factors, the counterweights and everything, all within a couple of grams of each other. And it all adds up to uh, production tolerances. So on the assembly line, any piston and rod assembly for this particular combination will fit any block, crank, you know, assembly. So that's what production tolerances are all about. That's what production balancing is all about. So there's never a worry. If you're taking a piston, let's say from a 302 Ford, you know, uh, out of one 302 Ford and popping into another 302 Ford, the balance is going to be the same, you know, providing that it's in configuration. Um, and in our case, since we're not disturbing anything as far as uh, we're not changing the pistons, we're not changing the rods, it's the original crank that went back in. This thing is production is 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 production tolerance clearance or, or balanced to spin to 5,500 to 6,000 RPM. We will not spin this thing that high. The, the top end of this engine is probably around 5,200, 5,300. This thing going, ain't going anywhere. So all the balancing is fine with that. Measuring clearances. Okay, if you guys are doing this is like your first engine, or you're not sure about your 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 uh, accuracy of measurements, you want to use something called plastic gauge. Now I don't use it. I don't have any of it hanging around here to show you how to use it. But there's plenty of tutorials on how to use plastic gauge. Um, and all plastic gauge is is a wax string that you pre-assemble the engine with that wax string between the, 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 the journal and either the main bearing or, the, uh, or the, the rod bearing. Tighten everything down and the amount that it squishes tells you what the clearances are. What I do is I just, I measure the journal and then I assemble a piston and rod or a main cap with the, with the new bearing in it. And I'll just, I'll measure that and then subtract the small number from the big number and there's your oil clearance. All right, so, and one other thing too, uh, pre-loop. You have to use a good quality pre-loop. Now for, for 40 years, I probably, I at least, I, I used STP or uh, Motor Honey, right? You know, just that stuff that the mechanic in a can, it works great as a pre-loop. Somebody, and then I used BG, right? When we had the, the fuel cars, we had a BG sponsorship. So I had tubes of that thing, all, that stuff all over the place. Somebody gave me a few tubes of this stuff. Uh, stable assembly lube and I've been using it and it works fine so but as long as it's something that sticks to the surfaces and gives you that first few seconds of running time before the oil pump has a chance to pick up the oil and circulate it through the system um, or I mean you could pre-lube it too but you still need to have some sort of assembly lube on this when you put the assembly lube on it when you first assemble this thing you'll find it, it the crank does not want to move very easily and that's that's just the thickness of the lube don't be freaked out if you know this the crank doesn't just spin like this um, and that is providing you check your oil clearances and everything is fine and when ter in terms of clearances listen to me right always err on the side of loops whenever you're doing the bottom end of an engine you know, there's, there's your tight clearance, there's your loose clearance, always err to the side of loose. Tight will get you in trouble. Loose, you know, maybe, maybe you'll lose three pounds of oil pressure, right? But it, it, loose is better than tight. So the next step with this is we got to knock pistons and rods in it, right? So our hone is done. We gave the whole engine a, a, a quick shot of, of just a light oil. Um, 
that's one of the reasons why you want to paint the engine before you do any assembly because it'll, you know, after you've cleaned the block and you've gotten all the residue off of it, you, now you've got this oil and the oil won't stick. So paint the block first. Pistons and rods. So here we have one of the pistons and rods as it came out of the engine and you can see that it was just an absolute disgusting mess, right? So here's your procedure with this. The first things first is give it a bath in some sort of degreaser. I use gasoline, use whatever works for you, right? Give it a good bath, get all of the oil, you know, uh, the oil off of it. There's still going to be a ton of gunk. Then, wire wheel. And this is exactly why we mount our bench grinder on a, on a, breakfast, on a snack table here. So that when we go to clean stuff, all the gas gets shot out into the world and not here in the shop. So you want to give your, your piston and rod assembly a nice, you know, going over with the wire wheel. Quiet. And then you want to inspect it. So the first thing you want to look for is to make sure that the knurling is still, still here on the skirts and that the skirts aren't chipped or cracked anywhere. This knurling is important because this holds a film of oil against the, 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 the cylinder wall. So the cross hatch holds a film of oil and this knurling holds a film of oil. Race, race engines don't have this. They'll have a smooth skirt, but they're not intended to operate you know, for extended periods of time under all different, all different conditions. So make sure that that's all intact. If you see it all scuffed away, odds are there's something wrong with the piston. It's not completely... Remember, pistons aren't round. They're actually elliptical shaped. And it, it may be something in the structure of the piston or, or make sure your knurling is there. Uh, that's important. Next, you want to make sure that the piston moves freely on the pin. After you've cleaned this thing with degreaser, you're going to, you're, you're obvi or gasoline, you've obviously taken the oil film off of things. Make sure before you put the thing back together again, you see these holes here at the bottom of the piston? Okay, make sure that you drop some lube in there. Uh, you could use just you know regular engine oil or the pre-lube is generally too thick but you want to just get some sort of light oil in there to make sure that the pin is lubricated when you go to put it back together again. So that's all got to spin freely. Um, now after you've cleaned the piston on the wire wheel and you've got it all looking okay like that, your next step is you want to clean out these ring lamps. This is really important. So what I do is I take an old ring like this, okay? Square the edge of the old ring. Break it. Break the ring. Okay? Square the edge of it on your grinder, right? Then wrap a little tape around it so that you got a handle and drag this through the ring land. And you see the stuff popping out of there? <laughs> on my old hammered chair, right? See the stuff falling out of there? That's carbon. And this is the only way you can get that out. Now it's important to get it all the way out. And the reason for that is that, remember that at the moment of combustion, gases are intended to get behind the ring, in the ring land, and push the ring land out, or push the ring out against the cylinder wall. That's where those marks at the top of the cylinder come from. You know, these things right here. There has to be adequate space between the ring and the base of the ring land for that pressure to get there and expand it. So you want to trace through all of your ring lands like this and knock all of that carbon out. First and second ring. By the way, do you ever wonder why you have a second ring on a piston? This is why you have a second ring on a piston. Because this wear right here, this little line, is like an inevitability. Uh, this is going to happen. And once this gets worn enough, you, a lot of com combustion gases will get past the top ring on this. And that's why street engines, most engines, use a second ring. All, all street engines use a second ring because stuff will get past the top and the second one grabs it. That's the purpose of that. That's why that thing is there. So, uh, also, as you're dragging the ring through here, you're feeling for any tight spots. If you feel any tight spots as you're dragging the ring through, going around, 
that ring land is damaged. It might be crushed. It might be uh, uh, just just deformed. The piston might not be you know completely right straight the way it's supposed to be. So if you if you as you're dragging this thing through, you come across a tight spot and you can't work that tight spot out by going like this. The piston is junk. Get yourself another one. Moving on to the bottom end of this. So. When you're looking over your bottom end, the cap, let me pop this off of here real quick. This is something you want to make sure that it's there. There's a cross hatch. You'll see that there's a cross hatch. And this is from when they machined the cap uh, to begin with, when they machined the rod to begin with. You want to make sure that cross hatch is still there. If you see any scuff marks or missing areas on that cross hatch, that means that this has gone somewhat out of round and the back of the bearing is scuffing against the rod. So you want to make sure, clean this thing really good, and make sure that you've got a trace of a cross hatch and no, you know, obviously deformed areas. You could check. If you're going to reuse the original rod bolts, and if it's an engine, it's only going to see 5,000 RPM or so, you don't need high performance rod bolts. But you can check them for stretch just to make sure that they're all within a thousandth or two of an inch from here to here. And that's pretty much it. Now, when I assemble these engines, I put the, I put the pistons in. I don't know, this, this good, here we go with the controversy, right? I put the pistons in backwards. I, I have done this since I'm 16. Every single engine I've ever built for myself had the pistons turned around backwards in the bores. And I did, I've done this since I was 16. And that's when I read about it in a direct connection racing manual. Because the factory said, you know, if you free up some power, turn the pistons around. They didn't say why, but they said turn the pistons around. And I've done it ever since. The, uh, and the reason you do that is because the pin is offset to one side. That offset is, is put there so that when the engine is first started, when the engine is cold, you don't hear the piston rocking in the bore at all. Uh, so what they do is they move, they, they move the pin. If you put the thing in backwards, you're freeing up some power. Now save, I, I see the comments already, right? Save the questions. Don't give me any questions in the comments about this. We will do a complete video, including back-to-back -back results. Of, of just turning the pistons around, what difference it makes when you just turn the pistons around. So we'll do a whole thing on that. So yes, you can do this to any engine that has an offset pin and a flat top to the piston. You can't do it with a domed piston. Um, so here's, just real quick, if you decide that you want to try to do this yourself, you see that every piston has a directional notch at the top of it, right? And that's supposed to face the front of the block. Every rod has a chamfer that goes against the cheek of the crank and it has an oil hole, most of them have oil holes, that's supposed to face across to the other bank. So what you do is, assuming you're not going to actually press the piston off and turn it back around, you want to leave this as an assembly, what you do is you take it from this side, right, swap it to this side and turn it around. And what that does is it reverses the offset by putting the pin to the back and but also keeps the orientation of the rod chamfer and the oil hole where it's supposed to be to do its job. But like I said, we're going to do a whole video on this down the road. Now one other thing too, uh, now that we're at the final stages of assembly of the short block, you have to make decisions as far as your ring gap goes. Now this is an engine that's never going to see nitrous oxide, it's never going to see supercharger, it's, never, it's, it's just going in, it's a daily driver. So the rings will be gapped or checked so that they're at production tolerances, which is around 18 thousandths of an inch or so. Um, if there is some chance that somewhere down the road you might be putting a supercharger on this thing, turbocharging it, or spraying it with nitrous, now's the time you want to open up the ring gaps. Generally speaking, a four inch bore, 30 thousandths of an inch ring gap, top ring, uh, and like 28 thousandths or so on the second ring, is, is where you want to be with that. And that's because when you add a power adder, you're, you're creating more heat. The ring expands more, especially a cast ring. Ring expands more, and if you don't have an adequate gap there, the ends of the ring will butt together, and it'll actually break the piston. That's the failure point on most, you know, people like, oh, cast pistons, cast pistons are junk. No, cast pistons are, are extremely strong. The problem comes when too tight of a ring gap causes the ring to buckle, and it'll break out the, the, the top of the piston here along along the uh, the ring land. So 
I think that's pretty much it, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna assemble the rest of the short block, and then next Sunday we're doing our live engine build down here with Lunar Outlaw Garage and John Wilburn, and that's what's going up to Nick's garage, and Nick is gonna put this thing on the dyno. Basically, we're gonna duplicate this on the engine and bottle rocket and see what it does on the dyno. Um, so on that note, I've got to get this pigsty cleaned up. I still have to mod I still have to do the weight on the converter. I still have to fabricate motor mount for this thing. So this week, I'm just going to assemble the rest of the short block, get the short block in the car so that that's out of the way. And then next week afterwards, we'll do the cylinder heads and top end and, and get it together and running. So I guess that's it for right now, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow.